Greetings citizens. Hey you, hey you beautiful creepy human being you. Welcome to my channel and welcome to today's true crime video. I'm so happy we could meet like this. I'm so happy that somehow in all of this that we're forced to deal with on the day today, today you and I were able to find each other on this crazy little planet that we call home. My name is Brittany or Brad or Sam, whichever you prefer. And today we're going to be discussing the complicated murder of 31 year old Maria Munoz. But before we get started, if you have not yet had the pleasure Please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put out a new video every single week, sometimes two a week, and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically you, but I can only do that if you join the Brat Pack and become one of us. And if you're new here, I just want to tell you that I don't normally sound like this. I'm getting over a several week long sickness. And so if you subscribe future videos, I won't sound so much like a frog. Thanks. Now, before I get into the details of today's case, I first need to say a big thank you to the sponsor of today's video, and that is Aura. So I want to start this off with a question for you, and that is this. Have you ever Googled your name and been surprised to see your private information, your personal information on one of those public listing sites? Because when I tell you, it's far more common for your information to get out there than you would think. Because a lot of you probably know, I used to work for a law firm for almost a decade and you have to you know, serve people with paperwork and we can find people like surprisingly easy. And that is because there are these things out there, these people, these companies called data brokers who take your personal information and they sell it to people that you do not want to have it like spammers and robocallers. And they can even find out where you live. I am not down with that sickness. I value my privacy and I value your privacy. And that is why I want to introduce you to Aura. Now, did you know that brokers are legally required to remove your information if you ask them to? Sounds great, right? Except they make it super difficult for you to figure out which brokers have your information. And that's where Aura comes into play. They identify, well, that's one of the ways Aura comes into play, right? They are able to identify which of those pesky data brokers have your information. And then they submit opt out requests on your behalf. They do the work so that you do not have to. When I signed up for Aura, the very first thing that I did is I went to the data broker opt out section because I was like, how many of them really have my information? And it turns out like 30, like 30. 30 of them had my information and Aura had already submitted opt out requests on my behalf. They also make sure that they do other things. Okay. They make sure that your information hasn't been leaked on the dark web and nobody wants their information leaked on the dark web. Let me tell you that we've had personal experience in this household with that. And it is such a pain. And they also make sure that your passwords that you use online, like, I don't know, for your banking are secure, which I checked mine because I've had the same password since 2007. It turns out, I did, I picked it right the first time because my passwords are incredibly strong and I wouldn't have known that. And I had been wondering that to be honest, and I wouldn't have known that if it wasn't for Aura. And those are just a couple of examples of how Aura protects you and your family from online threats that you just simply cannot see through just the Aura app, which is super easy to set up. You can get things like parental controls, uh, antivirus, VPN, password management, identity theft insurance, and more, and you get it all in one place, no need for several different apps, and you get it all at one affordable price. It sounds like a great deal to me, and listen, I'm not your mom, I can't tell you what to do, but what I can tell you is that I don't want people to exploit you and profit off of your personal information, and you don't have to You don't have to allow that to happen. You can let Aura do the hard work for you, like keeping you safe online, and of course, I have great, 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 the greatest of news for you today. Aura is offering members of the Brat Pack the opportunity to explore all they have to offer for free for two weeks, through my link. So if all of that sounds as good to you as it does to me, make sure to go to aura.com slash to let them know that I'm the one that sent you to get a 14 day free trial and see if any of your personal information has been leaked online. And if it has, let Aura help you put a stop to it today. Now I just want to say a big thank you to Aura for partnering with me on today's video. It's partners like Aura that make it possible for me to put out videos as consistently as I do. And a big thank you to you guys for always being so supportive of all of my sponsors. You rock, don't ever change. All right, now let's go ahead and get into this video. Now this video is on a case that I stumbled upon while I was looking into another case, a tale as old as time for me. I was, you know, clicking around on the internet, doing my research when I saw a headline that grabbed me and I can't remember the exact headline, but it was basically like murdered mother's journals help solve her own murder or help prove that she didn't commit suicide, something along those lines. And that headline along with the photo of Maria's smiling face, honestly stopped me in my tracks and I stopped researching the case that I was looking into and I had to read about Maria and man to read about her was so heartbreaking because I feel like her story leading up to her death is one that is so common. It's a story of an emotionally abused woman who was doing everything in her power to just 
hold on to her relationship with a man who didn't give a shit about how bad he was hurting her. And then he would go on to murder her. Or did he? That's the question. Because some people think that maybe he's not responsible, which is what we're going to, you know, delve into today. So today I'm going to tell you that entire story. I read all the things that you do not have to. And at the end of this video, I want you to answer the question of the day. I'm going to give it to you now so you can have it kicking around in your brain as we go through the details. But of course, I want you to answer once you have something to go on. But the question of the day is this. Do you believe that Maria's death, Maria's murder was intentional? Do you believe that her husband intentionally killed her? Or do you believe this was a tragic accident? And if you believe that it was intentional, what do you believe his motive was? Let me know all your thoughts in the comments below after we go through the details of this case. Now, with all of that said, come gather around and let me tell you the story of the murder of Maria Munoz. Our story today begins in the very early morning hours, like 1.30 in the morning. And this is in a small border town called Laredo, Texas. It's September 22nd, 2020, when a frantic call comes into 911. And the person on the other end is a 42 year old man named Joel Peyote. And he's telling the operator that he needs an ambulance. He needs somebody to get there now because his wife is not breathing and he thinks that she may be dead. And he tells the dispatcher that he believes that she took a large amount of prescription pills. Officers are dispatched to the home located at 203 Canyon Oak Drive. And while they're on their way, Hoel is crying and just like asking the operator, is anybody coming? And the operator assures him that like, yes, they are. When officers arrive at the home, Hoel answers the door and then runs up the stairs of his home. Well, not his home. We're actually going to get there. It's actually Maria's home. So he answers the door. He runs up the stairs. The first responders obviously follow him and they find him at the top of the stairs performing CPR on Maria. And he seems to know what he's doing. He's even wearing surgical scrubs because at this time, Hoel was a nurse anesthesiologist or a CRNA. So, you know, he had training in how to do CPR. And despite knowing what he's doing, the first responders are like, hey, you know, can we take over and try to, you know, save her? And he's like, yeah, go for it and let them take over. In the midst of trying to save Maria, the officer's like, okay, like what happened here? Ask Hoel, what happened here? You told the 911 operator that you thought she took some pills. Like, what's the story? And that's when Hoel gets up and he goes in the bathroom and he gets in the medicine cabinet. And he pulls out a bottle of clonazepam, clonazepam pills. He brings them to the officer and he's like, I gave these pills to her before jumping in the shower. When I gave her the bottle, it was pretty much full and now it's almost empty. And he made sure to tell the officer that Maria had been super depressed lately. Now, the first responders did everything in their power to save Maria's life, even though they knew when they got there that it probably wasn't going to be successful because she already looked like she was gone. She was super pale. Her eyes were totally dilated and there were no signs of life. But they tried. And after several attempts to revive her, Maria was pronounced dead just before, or just after, just around 4 a.m. that night. All while her two boys slept in the room right next door. Her sons were five and not even two. And they had to be woken up in the middle of the night with all of this happening and like led out of the house so that they could, you know, process the scene. And I saw body cam footage of this, of the cop being like, oh, you want to go see a fire truck to like get these boys outside. Can you even imagine how traumatizing all of that would be? It, it breaks my heart to think about these kids. It's just incredibly tragic. And the whole case became even more tragic when the layers started to get peeled back and they realized that what looked on the surface like a suicide, right? A woman who took her life by taking pills was anything but because they realized that one, Maria had no pill residue in her stomach, even though supposedly she took like this entire bottle of pills. Two, Hoel had a new girlfriend who he was living with. Three, Maria had just told him that she wanted a divorce and she was planning on taking their kids back to Puerto Rico. And four, police had found and looked through Maria's journals. So they were able to kind of get into her mindset. And it was clear that she had not committed suicide because she wasn't suicidal at all. And her husband may be to blame. So let's back up a little bit here. And I first want to talk about Maria. Maria Eugenia Munoz was born January 25th, 1989 to parents George and Marisol. And she was one of three kids with a sister named Marisol and a brother named Peter. Now there isn't very much information on Maria's early years. I know she lived in Puerto Rico and that's where her family was living when she was killed. But what I can tell you is that she seemed to be such an amazing woman, like such 
an amazing person. She was said to have the kindest soul and the biggest heart and to be the type of person that you could really rely on for love and support if you needed it. Her obituary said of her quote, she was the best daughter any parents could ask for. Her generosity, compassion, and genuinely devoted personality will be missed by all who knew and loved her. She was said to have a real passion for life and she was the type of person who had so many things on her list of things that she wanted to do that she wanted to accomplish. Like she wanted to get back into nursing, which is what she did as a job in Puerto Rico before she moved to the US. And she wanted to and was learning in the process of learning how to play piano. But what she was most passionate about in her life was her boys. She loved her boys and she doted on them. She lived for them. She was the type of mom who, you know, would sit there and read them a book every single night before bed, which I can relate to because that's what I do with my baby right now. And she was a stay at home mom. So her kids were like her entire world. And these two boys, they were the son of her and her husband, Howell. So Howell and Maria met while she was a young nurse back in Puerto Rico. She must have been like 20 years old at the time. And Howell was a medical student. The two met and he was 11 years older than her. So there was a bit of an age gap. But despite that, they really hit it off. And in 2011, they decided they wanted to make it, you know, this was for keeps for them. And they got married. After the two got married, they moved to Laredo to start their life together, which is where they were living when all of this happened. And Maria ended up leaving her job. She left her career as a nurse in Puerto Rico so that she could support her husband and eventually support her family once her kids were born. And this ended up being like an, an okay, a good choice, a good path for them because once they moved to Laredo, uh, Joel ended up getting a good job. He got hired at the doctor's hospital of Laredo. Yes, as a CRNA or a nurse anesthetist. I can't with that word. Anesthesiologist. I think that's the same thing. Anesthetist. My mouth doesn't like that word. Things seemed to be going really well for the couple at this time. They really seemed to be in love. Co-workers of Joel said that he was like a very devoted family man. He was always bragging about his wife, Maria. And then when his first son was born, he was always bragging about them too and always posting about them and photos of them on social media. And he seemed to be like truly obsessed with his family. But as the years went by, things started to change a bit. Howell himself started to change a bit. He started to lose weight. He started working out a lot. He started to lose weight and he started to gain muscle and he started to get more comfortable and confident talking to women. And with that, he got more flirtatious with women. So the guy who used to be completely obsessed and always posting about and always talking about his wife and kids stopped doing that. He stopped posting photos of them or anything about them altogether. He actually went back and deleted posts that he had made of or about his wife and just started posting about himself like he was a single guy. He started making more money and he started flaunting it by expensive things like luxury cars for not only him, but Maria as well. But he made sure to show people what he was able to afford and able to get. And all of that is fine and well. You can get luxury cars. You don't have to post about your family on social media. Like social media isn't real life. But he also started having an affair with one of his coworkers, which, you know, that is a problem. This was a woman named Janet. And they started having an affair around the time that Maria gave birth to her and Hoel's second son, which is an ultra dick move because that is like the most vulnerable time in a person's life right after they give birth. Like now that I've given birth, oh, if my husband would have cheated on me around that time, I would have been like, what? He would never cheat on me. We are, uh, you know, I'm lucky. But if he did, oh my God, that would be so horrible. But he did. He literally took this woman, Janet, on like a European vacation where they went to all these different countries, like Spain and France and Greece. And Maria found out about this affair while he was out of the country with this woman in 2020. So what it sounds like from the things that I read is that when Maria found out about this affair and when she would feel like he wasn't being faithful, etc, etc, he would just lie to her. He would love bomb her. He would make her feel like the affair wasn't as serious, that it had just been physical, that it was over. And he would do everything he could to keep her around. Like he wanted to have the cake and eat it too, as they say, instead of just getting a divorce and going and being with your girlfriend. Like, why does it, why do you gotta have both? 
I don't understand that mindset, but he would do that. Like, okay, he had just gone on this European vacation with his girlfriend. And I think it was just like months after he took Maria on this trip to Vegas where he like spent all this money on her and bought her two Louis, Louis Vuitton bags, just trying to show her that he was all in this with her and their boys and their family. But of course that did not last. And he would go back to Janet and reportedly he had even lived with Janet for like five months prior to Maria being killed. But it looks like he was kind of, you know, keeping a toe in both ponds. I don't think that's a saying. He was in two places at once, like in a walk to remember one foot over here, one foot over there. This is Janet, this is Maria. And he was keeping her around as well because he wasn't really sure what he wanted to do and he wanted to have both women. Now things reportedly came to a head on September 19th. So this would have been the Saturday before Maria was killed. And that's when she was driving around, maybe out looking for him, maybe not. But she's driving around and she sees her husband's car parked outside of Janet's home. And this wasn't the first time she had found him there, which makes sense since it reportedly he had lived with her for like five months prior to Maria being killed. It's very messy, but she gets there. She's rightfully fucking pissed. Gets out of her car, is pounding on the door, apparently like demanding her husband to come out. Apparently it got very intense and the cops even ended up being called. During this call altercation, apparently Maria told him like, you need to choose, you need to make a decision here. It's her or it's me. And sadly, he said that he chose Janet. I can't imagine how sad that would be for her, but he did. He was like, well, honestly, it would have been no loss for her. She deserved better than him. But I'm sure in that moment it was devastating for her. She's like, her or me? And he's like, her, which again, my heart, I'm so sorry. But for whatever reason, he still leaves Janet's house with Maria and they leave prior to the cops coming. Because remember, the cops are called. They leave before the cops get there. So they're on the road. They're leaving. Cops show up at Janet's house. Janet tells them what happened. They call Maria on her phone. To, you know, they got to still figure the situation out. So she answers the phone while she's with Howell and the police officer's body cam camera. Yeah. Was able to pick up the audio from this phone call. And you can hear that Howell is super fucking pissed off. And he's just like berating and cussing at his wife. In the recording, you can hear how he talks to her and it gives you an idea of what she went through. He says to her like, hey, hang up the fucking phone. I'm fucking talking to you, ETC, ETC. And apparently he was so pissed off that during this whole altercation, when he was in her car, he punched her windshield and like shattered her windshield. Not like shatter, like it didn't fall in or anything, but there was a big, you know, spider web out from the center. Like he punched and broke her windshield. And it's just sad because this wasn't the first time he had been a dick to her. We're going to get into her journal entries a bit later. But when police were investigating her death and they went through her cell phone, they found that she had like recorded a conversation between her and well, that I don't think he knew he was being recorded. But in this conversation, she's like trying her hardest to hold their family together. In this video, she says to him, quote, what is it that you want me to do? And what are your expectations that you have on this marriage? And she tells him like, if you get out of this car, we're done. And he's like, great, fuck it. And just leaves. Like he does not care at all how he's hurting her. And you can tell in these videos that he doesn't care. But anyways, this altercation on the 19th where she showed up at Janet's house, he punches her windshield, all that seemed to be the last straw for Maria because she ends up sending him a text once they're not together, telling him that she wants a divorce and that she's going to be hiring an attorney. And he responds to her saying, I want to give a quote, but it's kind of like a loose quote, basically saying that they could handle this with as little lawyer intervention as possible because it's too much money for them to hire an attorney. He was worried about the cost of a divorce. So at that point, he did seem to be on board with getting a divorce, but he seemed to change his tune a little bit and change his mind on getting a divorce at all. Instead, he wanted to talk to Maria. He texted her and he told her, no, he emailed her, excuse me, which is such a weird way to communicate with your partner. Maybe not. Do you email with your partner? Let me know down below. I do not. But he emailed her saying that, you know, he was hurting so bad inside. His heart was breaking. He just wanted to talk to her. He didn't want to argue. He didn't want to fight. He just wanted to have a heart to heart. So with that, Maria agreed to meet up with Howell on Monday night. And by 4 a.m. Tuesday, she was dead. So let's go back to that night and let's talk about what Howell said happened and what police found. So when officers arrived at the scene that night, they were just like, okay, so what happened here? Let me know what's going on. Catch me up. And Howell tells them like, okay, we were together. Everything was fine. We were having a fine evening. We were 
intimate with one another. And then I went to take a shower. But prior to getting in the shower, I gave Maria this bottle of the clonazepam pills because she wanted them. They were full. I go take a shower. I get out of the shower. She's in the bed. She's unresponsive. And the pill bottle is basically empty. Now, right away, the cops like, this doesn't really seem right. It wasn't really lining up with this evidence they had found at the scene. And Howell in general just seemed off. But luckily the officer was wearing like their body camera and it had been on. So it recorded the whole interaction, which is great because the officer saying like, this guy seemed off to me is one thing, but being able to show people how he seemed off is another. So the first thing that didn't quite line up was the fact that Hoel had said he had been in the shower, right? So you would think that the shower would be wet, that there would be steam, that there would be something, but no, totally dry, bone dry, quote, dry as a desert, the officer said. But in contrast to the desert dry shower, Howell was wet. He was sweating bullets, bro. And the officer was like, listen, I was set up with police gear. I had layers and layers on and I wasn't sweating. But this guy over here, just wearing a thin pair of scrubs, is sweating through his clothes, moist, if you will. And the cop thought to himself that Howell might even be on drugs. Another thing that the officer thought was really weird is that when he asked Howell, like, okay, where the pills that Maria took when, you know, they were doing CPR. Well, got up, went to the bathroom, went in the medicine cabinet and brought back the empty bottle of pills. And the cop thought this was weird because in their experience, when a person ODs on pills, the pill bottle is generally found with the person. They don't like take all the pills, go put it back in the medicine cabinet and then just lay there to wait to die. And speaking of weirdness and Howell and these pills, which by the way, were prescribed to him, not Maria. Uh, so when officers first arrived at the scene, they start doing CPR on Maria. They ask Howell what she took. He goes, he gets the pills from the medicine cabinet, tries to give them to the, the first responder. He's busy doing CPR. So he sets them on the ground. Da, 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 da. They realize they can't save Maria. Then they go to look at the pills now that they're not performing life-saving measures. And they realize that the pills are gone, even though they had been set on the floor. So this cop calls down to cops that are downstairs because at this time, Howell had gone downstairs to let the officers like work the scene. They're like, Hey, does he have the pills down there? And Howell's like, Oh yeah, no problem. Takes them out, tosses them back upstairs to the officer. Now, when they go back and look at the body cam footage, cause they're like, why is, why does he have them? They watch the body cam footage and they see that while this person is doing CPR, Howell sees the pills on the floor, scoops them up, puts them in his shirt pocket and then takes them with them. And they thought that this was super weird because they're like, why would he take them? What is he trying to hide? They also noted that Hoel was very evasive when they were asking him like basic questions, questions like when and how he found Maria in this state. He was like, I'm not answering that. And the officer even asks him, like the lead detective asks him like, why are you being evasive? Like, why aren't you being clear with us here? And Hoel tells him like, I'm a very private person and I don't want you to know everything about me in my life. And apparently when they wanted to search the house at first, he wasn't even going to let them search his house. But then they told him like, if you don't let us search it, we're going to have to go and get a court order. It's a whole thing. And once he realized that they were going to go through the legal steps to search the home, he's like, fine, you know what, just go for it. And it was while searching the home that police found some interesting things. Like for one, they found a syringe wrapper on the floor. They found a needle catheter on the stairs, like something you would use to put drugs into somebody's body. It was just laying there on the stairs and the couple had like two young boys. So why would that be there? And they also found a medical bag in the home that was filled with IV equipment and syringes. Now this might seem normal for Howell's job because he was like a nurse anest anesthetist, anesthetist. Um, but this, these were the types of things that generally were used in surgery. They're not the types of things that you would just bring home for yourself or like, oh, I just brought home some work with me. Like, no, you wouldn't bring this home with you. So with all of these things seeming interesting, they decide to put Howell in the back of a police car, take him down to the station and give him an interview. And when he's left in the, left in the loan, left alone in the interview room, he's like losing it. He's screaming. He's punching things. He's punching the wall. He's shoving furniture back and forth. He's being intense to say the least. He's even scaring people down the hall in the dispatch room with everything he's doing, which I don't know. I watched the video of him doing this and I know everyone grieves in different ways, but it felt very performative to me. That's what I'll say. 
Anyways, he was interviewed and he did his best to explain everything to police that he could. He told them that he had gone over that night to have a heart to heart with his wife because he was estranged. He said he had been living with his girlfriend, his girlfriend who he had been with for the last two years. And he had gone over to talk with his wife because the two of them were now finally considering divorce. He told police that Maria had known about the relationship he had with Janet for a long while and she had been having a hard time with it. She was very depressed. He said that that night when he went over to talk to her, she was depressed that night as well and that she had already been drinking. She had been drinking vodka and wine and had taken some uh, like weed gummies. He said despite, you know, him having a girlfriend, he and his wife did have the sex and that afterwards he gave her the clonazepam pills which were his that were prescribed for anxiety, went and got in the shower, got out, found her unresponsive, all the things I said. Police asked him about the medical supplies found in his house because like, that's weird. But he explained this away by saying that he himself used steroids and that that's what that was for. He denied ever injecting Maria with anything, though he did say that occasionally Maria would inject herself with testosterone because she wanted to be in good shape and said that, you know, she knew how to do injections because in Puerto Rico, she had been a nurse. When asked if there was any anesthesia in the home, he said he did not know. When asked if Maria had injected herself with anything that night, he said that he did not know. All he knew is that she needed relief and he knew that she had taken those pills. That was all, that was all he knew. So after this interview, the officers who had questioned Joel still felt very weird about the whole interaction. And so they called the DA's office or contacted the DA's office. However, one does that. And they shared their suspicions. And that's because Joel, you know, had tried to explain everything, but there was one thing that stood out to them. One thing that he wasn't able to explain. And it was something that seemed incredibly suspicious. And this is that in the crook of Maria's elbow, like her, her right arm in the crook, there was a small red dot, like a sore, the type of sore one might get if they had had an IV inserted into their vein. You know, if you've ever done it, you know what I'm talking about. Now, prosecutors and police did think that this was all weird, but at this time it was just a feeling. They didn't have any evidence to, to back up their feelings. So they had to let him go. I mean, at this point, they didn't even know what her manner of death was. Like they didn't know if it was an accident, if it was suicide, or if it was a murder. So they keep investigating. They don't just sit back and wait for the autopsy. They're, they are, I mean, they are waiting for the autopsy so that they can figure out, you know, how she died, how it has been determined, how it was determined that she died. But in the meantime, they are investigating. And during their investigation, they become inundated with phone calls from friends, family members, so many people who loved and cared about Maria, who just did not believe that she would have ever taken her own life. Then in addition to that, police found a bunch of journal entries written by Maria. She was one of those people who often wrote about her life and about her feelings. She documented her existence. And through looking at these, they discovered that Maria was discouraged. She loved her family, loved her husband and wanted to keep her family together, but could see that her husband wanted to be with somebody else and had accepted it. She also wrote of her future, her wants, her needs. She wanted to be a good present mother for her kids. And she was hopeful about moving forward. She wrote about life being unfair. She wrote about her husband, the man she loved causing her so much pain. And she wrote about how sad she was and how all she wanted was for him to change, but that she accepted that he was not going to change. And then the day before she died, she wrote in her journal and she wrote about the things that she wanted. Okay. Like her list of things that she wanted. And the number one thing on her list that she wanted was to move forward because of this, because of these factors. In addition to the fact that though Hoel said that Maria had taken all those pills and that is what likely killed her, she had no pill residue in her stomach. Don't get me wrong. She had drugs in her system. She had a good amount of drugs in her system, but there was no proof that she's the person who took those drugs herself. Like for example, there was no residue on her fingers, her hands, her mouth, nothing, just a puncture wound. And there were like several puncture wounds to show that she was like a habitual injector. There was just the one. Because of all this, the medical examiner ruled out suicide. She actually said that she had never even considered suicide when looking at the overall picture of this death. She said from the very beginning, she believed it was either murder or a tragic accident. Now, this wasn't the conclusion the prosecution was 
hoping for. Obviously, a ruling of her death being a homicide would be a much more helpful determination, but it wasn't being ruled a suicide. So that was a start. And it was a huge relief for those who loved her, who just did not believe at all that she would have taken her own life. I mean, don't get me wrong. It wasn't that no one thought that this was in the realm of possibility at all. Like her sister Marisol, when she first heard about it, thought it was possible Maria could have done this because she just didn't think she couldn't conceive of the idea of Hoel hurting Maria. And she thought that maybe all of the pain that he had put her through had gotten to be too much for Maria. And she said of this quote, I did not think he was guilty or that he had done it, but I thought because of him and their situation, it led her to take her own life. And she added, quote, he made her suffer in person a lot, a lot. It was two years of marital troubles, but at the same time, he would not let her go because when she would try, he would come and tell her he loved her, that he could bring back the passion. He manipulated her. She would say, I can't leave him because he loves me. She would say that to me. So I just want to be fair. I don't want to be like, no one thought it was at all possible she could do this because some people did think it was possible. But at the same time, Marisol, the one person who did think it was possible, didn't really think she did this. I mean, she had just talked to Maria and just heard that Maria was going to hire an attorney and she had plans to go back to Puerto Rico. So why would she then take her life? On top of that, before she died, like right before she died, Maria had been talking to her friend Yasmin and Yasmin said she didn't seem suicidal at all. But she had told her she was going to have a heart to heart with Hoel and she was nervous. She was nervous going into what would probably be their last, you know, civil conversation as a married couple, but she didn't seem suicidal at all. And when Maria asked her if she would pray for her, Yasmin said she would. Now, back to the autopsy. So when it was determined that Maria had died of a drug overdose, but not the pills that Hoel had said she took, police received another call. Now, this wasn't from a friend or a family member of Maria's. This was actually a call from Hoel's former boss. This was anesthesiologist Dr. Hunslinger. Hunslinger. Yeah. So Dr. Hunslinger, Dr. John, his name was John. He heard that Maria had died of a drug overdose and he thought this was suspicious. So he contacted the police department and he urged them to do a full toxicology screening to find out what Maria was killed from, like what drugs killed her, and even gave them a list of things to look for. Now it took almost four months for the toxicology reports to come back and these were a tense four months, okay, because Hoel was free. He was free to come and go as he pleased. He was free to live with his girlfriend. During this time, they had Maria's funeral and he was there, right? He was listed in her obituary as her loving husband. He was at her funeral and he rubbed people the wrong way at her funeral because he was like leaning over her coffin and crying and wailing and touching her face and giving her kisses. And even though at this time he hadn't been arrested, he hadn't even been publicly accused yet, people still thought it was weird because they knew that for a while this guy had been making her miserable and now that she's dead he's here like oh my god and they were like no but anyways four months after maria was killed her toxicology report came back and it showed that she had a lot of drugs in her system she had seven different drugs in her system there was morphine demerol versed don't know what that is don't know what any of this is propofol ketamine do know what that is lidocaine and Narcan. Notably, there was no clonazepam, even though that's what Hoel said she had taken. And even more notably than that, or more notable, more notably, more importantly, is that all of these drugs that had been in her system were drugs that Hoel used at work for surgery, like in his job. And the most notable, the most notably thing of all is that one of these drugs would only be able to be administered by injection, like by an IV, by a needle in the body. Reportedly, this was the drug propofol. The propofol is only done by injection, which isn't that the drug that killed Michael Jackson? I think it is, but basically propofol is not like a party drug. It's something that they give you in surgery to relax you. And if you take too much, it can stop your breathing. And based on Maria's toxicology report, she had taken a lot. She had a lot of this in her system. I say she had taken. They don't think she took anything. There was a lot of propofol in her system. 
Dr. John, you remember Hoel's old boss, had looked at the levels and said that this was like the highest amount he had ever seen in anyone's system. And he said of this quote, I believe this was death by propofol. With that, Joel Peyot was arrested for the murder of his wife, Maria Eugenia Munoz. And when they went to pick him up, it was like a super easy arrest. They went, they knock on the door or whatever. He comes out and he just puts his arms up. He's like ready to be arrested. And he has held on a $200,000 bail, which he made obviously because he had money. He was able to bail himself out, but he wouldn't be out for long. Now this is because police had been talking to Joel's girlfriend, Janet. Now they had talked to her before. They actually talked to her right after Maria was found to be dead. And she seemed genuinely shocked, genuinely shocked to hear that Maria had died and particularly shocked to learn that she had died of a drug overdose. But Janet told him like, I had nothing to do with this. Once Hoel was released on bail though, they spoke to her again. And this time they were speaking to her with their attorney. And during this meeting, they were able to convince her to testify against Joel. And by convince her, I mean kind of push her a little bit into a corner because they were thinking of charging her because they believe that she may be more involved with what happened to Maria than she was letting on. So she was given immunity in exchange for her testimony against Hoel. And then she had a lot to say, a lot to say that was particularly helpful for investigators, like the fact that she told them that Hoel told her that the night that Maria died, he had, in fact, injected her with something to, quote, calm her down. Janet said specifically of this quote, he wanted to uh, just calm her down. So he did it with medication. He also told her that he had disposed of some of the items that he had used to drug Maria prior to police arriving. And speaking of destroying evidence, which is what he was doing there when he got rid of things before the police arrived. After Janet had been interviewed by police the first time, so Hoel was still free, right? Her and Hoel met up. He came over to her house and he requested that she delete all of her ring doorbell footage. He didn't want the police to be able to find any of the ring doorbell footage in case they were to see something. And she said that she did this, that she did what he wanted because she was scared. She was scared that police would come to her house and they would think she was involved because she had some things in her possession, namely drugs that could have been used to kill Maria, like the fentanyl, the morphine, the lidocaine, et cetera, et cetera. So she was scared. So that's why she did what she did. And she said that both her and Hoel used these drugs recreationally, like to have a good time. And she said they were able to get them because Hoel, due to his position at work, had unsupervised um, access to drugs. So he was able to just steal drugs from work for them to use together. Now, that's quite a bit of information, is it not? And it's due to that information, the information that, you know, he had gotten rid of things and asked her to delete door, ring doorbell footage that made it so that Hoel could be rearrested this time on charges of tampering with evidence. But again, he did make bail, so he had to pay even more money, got out on bail and had to wear an ankle monitor until his trial, a trial that Maria's family was going to be flying from Puerto Rico to Texas to attend. So the trial, the prosecution was actually a team of all women. And these women had sort of developed a bond and they felt like they knew Maria from like reading her journals and learning about her. It made them feel very motivated to get justice for her because they felt like, they felt like she had no power in her relationship. And they told the court that they were like, she was an abused woman who had no power here. So they wanted to be the voice for her that she didn't have. One of her attorneys said of this, and I quote, I've heard of emotional abuse. I've seen it. I've worked around it, but I never realized how prevalent it is even in our lives where you can relate to some of the things that Maria was experiencing. Howell had literally crushed Maria's spirit and then stole her life. And they believe that the way he did this is that he had taken the drugs, not the one that had to be injected, but he took some drugs. He put them in her coffee so that when they met that night, she, you know, fell into unconsciousness. And then he was able to inject the propofol into her, her vein, like in that arm, in that arm, in that hole in her arm. Remember the red dot? They believe he injected her and that's how he killed her. They then believe that he waited to call 911 until he was sure she was dead. So she could not be saved. As for the defense, they really leaned on the fact that Maria's manner of death was listed as undetermined, not as homicide. And they told the court that this was just a horrible, tragic accident. They said that Hoel did not go over to Maria's house that night to kill her. He went over there to talk to her and to see if they could work on their marriage. And he said, or he, they, 
the defense, said that both Joel and Maria were drug addicts and that Maria had already taken a bunch of drugs when he got there and that Joel had panicked and tried to save her with the Narcan. And he said of this quote, someone tried to bring her back to life and it wasn't the paramedics, it wasn't the police, it was Joel. To which I say the paramedics and the police did get there and try to save her life. So I don't know what the fuck Homeboy's talking about, but that is what he said. But anyways, the attorney added that clearly Howell's attempt to save Maria showed that he did not want her dead, which proved that this was an accident. And the Narcan thing. Okay, this is the one thing when looking into this case that I was like, that is a little bit weird. That, that's weird because I cannot see, and for my research, I cannot find a reason one would administer Narcan if not to reverse the effects of an opioid overdose, right? So it does seem like perhaps he tried to save her, but the prosecution does address this. And they said that they believe that this was smoke and mirrors to make it look like Howell tried to save her so he wouldn't look guilty because he knew he had given her propofol and he knew that the Narcan would have no effect on the propofol overdose. Now the defense did try to bring up character witnesses to make Howell seem less shitty, but one of the people they brought up was actually his mom. So it's like, how serious are you going to take his mom? How impactful is her saying her son's like not a piece of shit going to be? But you know, she was there regardless. And she said he was a good person, a good son and a good father. But if you read her testimony to me, it kind of seems like she was more valuable for the prosecution than the defense. She said that her son was innocent and she said she loved Maria like a daughter. She did say that she knew about Howell's, uh, you know, affair. And she knew that Maria wanted a divorce. She said that Maria and her had talked and she had told her that she understands that everybody has a limit and that Maria was at hers. And if she was to leave Howell, that she would still accept her with open arms into their family. She did say that she had asked Howell and Maria to work on their marriage, but that she could tell they were at a place where it was just over. And she also told the court of some weird requests that Howell had made to her, like, asking her to go and delete a Facebook post that he had made about Maria and asking his mother to go and delete Maria's Facebook page altogether. Both requests that she refused to do. And I don't know her obviously, right? I'm just some girl on the internet, but I do, from what I've read, she seems like a nice enough person. She seemed genuinely devastated that Maria was gone. And I believe Howell and Maria's kids are with her. At least they were for a time. And this was actually really sad and really tragic because like Maria's family doesn't get to see those kids there. They live in Puerto Rico and uh, Maria's sister Marisol said that the only time she had seen them was over video chat. So that's another like tragic part of this story is that Maria's family lost her and they don't even like get to see the kids. But anyways, all of that is to say that I don't feel like her testimony was super useful to the defense, but regardless, they pressed on. Howell's attorneys told the court that Maria's mental state was not good she had been in suicide. She had been in suicidal. She had been in therapy and was suicidal, but clearly based on what happened here, the therapy wasn't working, but the prosecution disagreed. Obviously they said that, yes, her journal showed that she was experiencing sadness and was in a depression. She was literally watching her marriage dissolve in front of her eyes, but her husband was holding on to her at the same time, gaslighting her and love bombing her whenever she got close to ending things. She had this friend who she'd known since 1997, like they were old friends. And she testified at court and told them that Maria had been on an emotional roller coaster and that her social media posts did go from sweet to like dark and a little depressing. And this friend also said that Maria would, you know, go through her husband's cell phone bills and go to his girlfriend's Facebook page. Like she was really spiraling on this issue, but she was also getting help she had been getting medical attention for her mental health struggles and she had been leaning on friends and family and her faith. She had been talking to her pastors about all of the, of the things that had been weighing on her. And if you're to read her journal entries, you could see that she was improving and she was coming out on the other side of this. She wanted to move on with her life. She was looking forward to the future. She loved her kids and she wanted to be there to take care of her kids. One of which is described as having special needs. And she wrote about wanting to do things with them in the future. In her journals, she wrote specifically quote, I want to be a good mom, a mom that's present and engaged and involved with my kids. She also wrote a list of her fears. And at the very top, her very first fear was quote, losing my family. Maria's team, which was the prosecution said that, Maria's writings were the most important witness that they had at trial because they could feel her character through her own words. 
They could show her personality, her energy, and how she loved life and loved being a mother. They also had Maria's sister testify. She flew in from Puerto Rico to be present at this hearing and she told the court that her sister was ready to move on. She was planning to divorce Joel and move back to Puerto Rico. So clearly she was making plans for her future. So why would she have taken her own life? They also had testimony from one of Joel's friends slash co-workers named Luis or Luis, who Joel had been talking to about his, you know, pending separation, his pending divorce. And he was saying to him that this was like a difficult situation he was in and that he was really worried about having to pay child support. And if that wasn't enough, they also had the testimony of Janet, who literally told the court that Joel stole the drugs from his work and admitted to her that he had drugged Maria the night that she died. The defense ended or arrested their case by reminding the court, the jury, that Howell was a nurse who never had any previous issues with the law and all that the prosecution had proven was that he was a cheater, that he had cheated on his wife, but they had not proven that he had killed her. And then his defense attorney said, quote, Joel loved Maria. Maria loved Joel. They had problems. We captured in this case a moment in time that was bad for them, but he loved her. The prosecution, though, said that Joel was a master manipulator and asked the jury to use their good old fashioned common sense. They reminded the jury that Joel had an affair, that he stole drugs from work, the same drugs that were found in Maria's system. And they highlighted the propofol and said that this was the nail in Joel's coffin because propofol was in Maria's system and Joel was the only person who could have put it there. They also reminded the jury that Howell had tried to, to had tried and succeeded at destroying evidence. He destroyed IV kits and vials and Maria's cell phone, and even tried to destroy Maria herself when he insisted to her family that Maria be cremated, like as quickly as possible. The prosecution said that Maria's real final wish was just to be free, right? She had tried, she had worked and fought long and hard to keep her marriage together. But she had come to terms with the fact that her husband didn't care, didn't want to keep the marriage together. And so she just wanted to move on, to leave him and to get on with her life. But Joel didn't want to pay for that. He had killed Maria to avoid a costly divorce and to avoid splitting up his assets. And the prosecution said of this quote, his wife loved him dearly and he took advantage of that. This man who never even testified, by the way, never testified at his trial. The jury was sent to deliberate, and on March 30th, 2023, after about a week of trial and less than two hours of deliberation, the jury came back with their verdict, and they had found Joel Peyot guilty of the murder of his wife, Maria Munoz. When the verdict was read out, Maria's family just like broke out into sobs, and Joel's family was like very clearly shocked. Now, the state was pushing for a life sentence, obviously, and the defense was honestly funny. They asked that the court sentence him to just five years, which I was like, that's bold, but I guess you got to do what you got to do. Ultimately, he was sentenced to life in prison for the murder and an additional 10 years for the evidence tampering and a $10,000 fine. And he will be eligible for parole in 2053 for the first time. And that is when he is 75 years old or will be 75 years old. After the sentencing, Joel had to sit there and listen to the victim impact state victim impact statements from the people he destroyed from Maria's family, her father, her brother, and her sister, because by this time, Maria's mother had already died. The DA read Maria's father's statement for him to the court. And in the statement, he wrote about how he had been happy with Maria's marriage, that he had blessed this marriage because his daughter seemed so happy and that he had let Hoel take his daughter. And that 11 years later, he had returned his daughter to him in an urn. He said that not only did Hoel kill his daughter, but he killed his happiness. He killed his ideas for the future that he saw with his daughter and his grandkids. And he said that he hopes Hoel suffers every single night for every time he made Maria cry. Maria's brother, Peter, who apparently helped raise Maria, said that he gets in tears. He finds himself in tears when he looks at his phone and sees missed calls from Maria that he didn't answer because he wants so badly to be able to call her back and he can't. And he said, he added to this rather quote, I hope every time you hear Maria's name and when the kids ask for their mom, you suffer. He then said that he hopes justice is served and he hopes that Joel has to pay for all the suffering he's caused. Last to confront Joel was Marisol, Maria's sister, who said that she had been waiting for two and a half years to be able to sit 
and confront Hoel and tell him how he had turned her life into a nightmare. She reminded him that when she met him, she was just 15 years old and her mother had just died and he had been there for her. He had been there as a family member to her and that he knew that after her mother died, Maria had taken on that role. And then 10 years later, he killed her too. Well, he didn't kill her mother, but you know, he took her away from Marisol too. She told him like, bro, you murdered my sister all for a woman who doesn't even care about you. Which man, isn't that always the way? Isn't that always the way he does this, right? He kills his wife because he doesn't want to be with her anymore. He wants to be with this new girl. He does all of this so that he can start a new life with this new woman who literally took a deal to testify against you to put you in jail for the rest of your life to save hers. So stupid. Anyways, Marisol ended her statement with telling Howell that Maria is free from his control and she can finally rest in peace. Which of course that couldn't really be the case because by mid 2023, so just like months after his conviction, his attorneys went to the court saying that they were going to appeal. They wanted to get a new sentence based on some issues with some of the jurors at the original trial. Which man, and when I tell you that this seemed like such a clusterfuck of a motion for a new trial, because when they filed the paperwork, initially they said that they wanted a new trial because two of the jury members had been deaf. So they wouldn't have been able to hear during the trial. Then they took that paperwork back and they're like, just kidding. Nobody was deaf. One person was actually mute. So we want a new trial. And this just seems like the type of thing that you might have noticed during jury selection. You have to like ask them questions and shit. And it seems like you would know if somebody was mute. But either way, the motion for the new trial was, you know, dismissed or it's not happening. Man, this case is just so sad to me because across the board, it seems like Maria really just like loved her family and loved Hoel and he emotionally tortured her. One of the prosecutors on Maria's team during her hearing, her name was Karina Rios, I believe, she said it best when she said, quote, I think sometimes the worst injuries don't even leave a mark. The injuries on your heart, on your mind. And man, that's what Hoel did. He consistently hurt her, broke her heart, stole her hope, and then stole her life. And with that, that my friends is the story of the complicated murder of Maria Munoz. I hope you found my telling of this to be informative. And of course, I hope it made sense. And I just wanna thank you for remembering Maria with me today. Now, considering everything I told you throughout this video, I wanna revisit the question of the day. If you recall, the question of the day was this. Do you believe that Hoel intentionally murdered Maria? Or do you believe that this was a tragic accident? Because I can see how this could go like this. I really do. It's one of those cases that I'm like, damn, I don't know. I, can't, I I mean, I do. I feel like he, I feel like he did it, but I can definitely see in this case how people could see that he didn't. So I'm curious as to what you think. And if you think he did it, what do you believe his motive was? Why did he kill her? Let me know all your thoughts in the comments below. I feel like it could be divisive, but you know, you guys surprise me all the time. Before you leave, please don't forget to leave me a comment down below with any case suggestions you have for the future, as you know or you may not know. I have a long list of cases, and whenever you leave your suggestion, I put it on my list with your name next to it, so if I cover it, I can give you a shout out. I love looking into the cases you guys suggest, because they're often cases I haven't heard of, or cases that need more coverage, and I know you're filled with great ideas and great taste, otherwise you would not be here. If you haven't already, please don't forget to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing that bell. I put out a new video every single week, sometimes two a week, and I would love to hang out with you. Yes, you specifically you, but I can only do that if you join the Rat Pack and become one of us. One of us, one of us, one of us. And if you want to hang out more consistently, all my social media is listed down below, along with a link to my membership and a link to my merch store. If you've made it this far, first off, you're a real one. Second off, I'm sorry, my voice sounds like this. Uh, this is the first video I'm filming back from being sick. I'm still sick. I was the last one to get sick. My husband's doing a lot better. Baby, finally, no fever, nothing's wrong. Me, I was the last one to get it, so I'm the last one to get over it. So hopefully everything made sense. The audio is okay. My voice isn't too bad. I feel like I should do something in the beginning that says like, I don't normally sound like this if you're new, but you know, we'll just see what happens here. But anyway, with all of that said, I just want to thank you for being here. When you could literally be anywhere else in the world, that is tight. You are tight. Please stay safe and be a better person than you were yesterday. And I hope to see you in my next video.